hide your lion eyes. There ain't no way to hide your lion eyes. So let's just start with a few whoppers from all over the world. Lance Armstrong. For years, he denied allegations of doping as he won the Tour de France seven times. But earlier this year, he admitted to the world's mother confessor, Oprah Winfrey, that he had, in fact, taken illegal performance-enhancing drugs. Since then, however, the CEO of the American Anti-Doping Authority has claimed that Armstrong even lied to Winfrey. Though apparently he minimised his misdemeanours so he could get a chance to ride again. Well, here in Australia, two months ago, a Qantas flight to Townsville was diverted to Rockhampton. A spokeswoman for the airline made a statement, and here's what she said, I quote, <clears throat> The plane was not maintaining its normal air pressure. She said, In line with standard procedure, the captain initiated a descent to 10,000 feet. The passengers were calm throughout the descent and there were no reports of any adverse effects on anyone, including the crew. So the next day, there was another report about the same event and this time it included an account from a passenger. So this man said, It was definitely the scariest day of my life. It was the worst thing I have been through. I was shaking. There were people crying. Everyone was quite quiet and in shock. So this man said that the passengers had been told to brace for a rapid descent. And after that announcement, the plane plummeted 30,000 feet in five minutes. In Europe, in 2011, after the people of Greece had suffered many disastrous financial cuts and a great deal of turbulence in their government, there was a lot of speculation about whether Greece would be asked to leave the European Union. So a group of reporters tracked down the head of the Council of Eurozone Financial Ministers and they asked him, would the ministers be meeting to discuss the crisis? There was a sense that if they were meeting, that it would mean Europe was right on the edge. Repeatedly, the minister said no, they would not be meeting. A few days later, he admitted, yes, actually, in fact, they had met. When he was asked about this, by way of rationale, this democratically elected representative of the people of Europe said, well, when it becomes serious, you have to lie. So my message today is that, in fact, he was right, at least about one thing. I think our situation is really serious. Not only are we being lied to more and more, but lying in the 21st century is far more insidious than anything we've had to deal with before. There are a number of reasons for that, but one that I want to think about most today is the fact that the amount of information in our lives has increased exponentially since just the start of this century. So just by way of example, at the end of last year, there were 250 million tweets being sent every single day. Uh, according to YouTube, 72 hours of video are uploaded to their site every single minute. There was a study that looked at the amount of information that was sent through broadcast technology for just the year 2007. And what these people found was that that amount of information was equivalent to every person in the world reading 174 newspapers every day. So, because there's more information, there is more misinformation, and there is more bad information. What makes this worse is that our basic human experience of all this information is like waking up every day and just being hit in the face with a fire hose. That makes it really hard to tell the good stuff from the bad stuff. So, I'm going to be making a number of suggestions to you today based on my experiences as a reporter and as someone who handles information every day. But before we start walking through those ideas, what I want to encourage you to do is to turn off the information firehose. So turn off your computers, turn off your phones, 
turn off that device, whatever it is that you check, about 10 minutes every day. Because I think if we don't start turning off, what's going to happen is we will never hear that small voice in the back of our head that's asking us, were there no reports of anyone suffering any adverse effects on that plane? Because no one suffered any adverse effects on that plane. Or were there no reports of anyone suffering adverse effects on that plane? Because Qantas, which is in a position to make those reports, did not make those reports. Well, it's not just Armstrong and airlines and the European Union. It's Italian cruise ship captains who crash their ship and then say, if it wasn't for me, more people would have died. It's activists releasing fake press releases from the ANZ Bank about Whitehaven coal and the stock market reacting so fast to it that a whole group of mum and dad investors lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's horse meat masquerading as cow meat. And apparently in some circumstances, it's donkey meat masquerading as horse meat, masquerading as cow meat. So how did it come to this? I want to talk to you a little bit about the evolutionary history of deception. And then I'm going to look at some lies in the modern world. And I'm particularly interested in lies to do with real estate in the media. And after that, I'm going to ask, what can we do to protect ourselves from these lies? So in the last 15 years or so, scientists have confirmed that apes are capable not just of thinking, but also of thinking about thinking. So we are apes, orangutans are apes, gorillas are apes, chimpanzees are apes. And what this means is that an ape can consider another ape's thoughts. An ape can look at another ape looking at something, and they can think about what that ape is seeing. And then an ape can take this incredibly sophisticated ability and they can use it to mess with that other ape. So if you're here today to visit the zoo's residence, please take the time to visit the beautiful Gabby, the orangutan. She's in the enclosure over there. Gabby was born here in the Melbourne Zoo 20 years ago out of an act of lust and a campaign of betrayal. Gabby's mother, Kiana, was on the contraceptive pill. At least that's what her keepers thought. So every day they would give her the pill and then every day she would put it in her mouth and then every day when her keepers were no longer looking she would take the pill out of her mouth and with those beautiful long orangutan fingers she would feed it to Santan, the male orangutan. <laughs> so apparently the human contraceptive pill doesn't have much effect on male orangutans. <laughs> because Kiana began to put on weight. And this was very confusing to everyone because the diets of the animals are very carefully controlled and it keeps them to keep them healthy. Um, of course, it then became clear sometime after that when Kiana gave birth to Gabby. Stories like this are often dismissed as anecdotal. And that's actually a reasonable thing. If you're going to make a claim as huge as the claim that an ape can deceive another ape on purpose, then you want to be able to test that. So there's a group of researchers who've done a lot of chimpanzee work based in the States and Germany. They ran an experiment recently where they had a chimpanzee and food and a human. And apparently both food and also the sense of competition bring out the best in chimpanzees. So there were, there were some situations where the human was looking at the food and there were some situations where the human was looking away from the food. There were some situations where there was a barrier behind which the chimpanzee could approach the food unseen. And there were other situations where there was a barrier, but it was translucent. So you could still see the chimpanzee, the chimpanzee knew it could still be seen. So it turns out that chimpanzees greatly prefer to approach their food unseen. And if a human was watching, but there was nothing to hide behind, the chimpanzee would take a circuitous route to the food as if to fool the human about what its intentions were. If there was no one watching the food, the chimpanzees never took an alternate route. They just went straight to it. So if we can lie, and if chimpanzees can be sneaky, and if orangutans can pretend they're being compliant with their meds, 
what this actually means or what this likely means is that the common ancestor of all of the apes, the great apes together, was a creature that knew how to deceive. The common ancestor of the great apes lived 14 million years ago. So I think we can jump straight away to at least one conclusion, and that is that we're not going to protect ourselves from lies by getting rid of them. So whether you call it an adaptive trait, or you call it a devil's handiwork, lying is literally older than the hills. Human lying, however, has taken a few evolutionary leaps since then. We took this really ancient skill and we finessed it with the invention of language. And this was an accumulation of many abilities over many hundreds of thousands of years. But even as we learned to lie with words, we also learned how to tell when someone was lying with words. So you may not know why you feel suspicion, whether someone is holding your gaze a little too long, or maybe you just get a funny feeling when they talk. We've actually developed some pretty good instincts about lies, and we've learned to be reasonably good lie detectors. The line changed again with the invention of writing. So this is a really important stage, because when you take the lie away from the body, when you can no longer match someone's words against their face or against their movement, you could be fooled much more easily. You can even write down a lie, you can die, and then you can fool someone who's born long after you. Lying changed yet again with the invention of the printing press. You can print and spread and reproduce the same lie far more efficiently. It changed again with the invention of computers. So we've got much faster, better, cheaper lying in a variety of fonts. It changed yet again with the adoption or the worldwide adoption of the internet. This happened around 1998. And what it means is that we now have instantaneous global lives. So to a large extent, Gabby, our cousin, lives in the physical world and to the, in the beautiful present moment. We also, of course, live in the physical world, but we also live in this complicated world, or this universe, really, of symbols and information. Our problem is that as the universe becomes denser, as it spins faster, we seem to be getting most of our ideas and we are making most of our decisions in that very ephemeral, cheaply accessed and relatively unedited space. And we haven't had millions of years to work out who's lying and who's not lying in that space. We've had about 15 years. I think there is at least one truth that has been constant through all that time. And that is that lying and truth are always related to power. They're always related to winning and they are always related to survival. So here we are. We are surrounded by white lies. That's okay. Everyone does it. We are surrounded by corporate lies. We are also surrounded at this time by some very dark and disturbing religious lies. So I want to run now through some types of lies that I've noticed in media coverage of real estate. But before we get into that, it's really important to acknowledge up front that the relationship between the media and real estate has always been less than straightforward. And that's because for many years, newspapers in particular relied on the classified sections, and the classified sections were primarily real estate. There's no easy way for us to deal with this. You cannot ban advertising. It's not realistic, and it's not democratic. In Argentina earlier this year, the government overnight banned all advertising. The inflation in that country has been out of control for a very long time, and the, the goal of this measure was, was, was at least partly to halt inflation, but it was also about strangling the media. And I think it's unsatisfying, as I'm sure we all find the media to be, a lot of the time, you know that when the government tries to take the media down overnight, then everyone is in trouble. Still, as the volume of content has exploded, I think some really important barriers have broken down between the reporter and the reader, the writer, and whoever's on the other side of what's being written. 
And my concern, or one of my concerns, is that the almost entirely exuberant coverage of real estate up until the end of 2010 has led some young people to make the biggest financial decision of their lives and some older couples to release the equity in their otherwise stable homes. But that in the absence of this coverage, they would not necessarily have made those decisions. So let's run through a few kinds of lies. There are lies of omission. I want to read to you just a small quote from a fairly typical article that is celebrating the choices of first home buyers. This is a young man, he's 23. He's really happy because he's bought a house with his girlfriend and he's talking about himself and his friends. He says, I think people in their early 20s are quite interested in property. They're interested in getting their first home. Nowhere in the article does it mention that this young man is a real estate agent. And he is a real estate agent for the firm that is mentioned in the article. Here's another one. This is a property buyer in Brisbane telling a journalist that she's keen to capitalise on the low prices following the Queensland floods. She says, I don't think interest rates will go up, but even if they did, it's still a good time to get into the market. She is also a real estate agent, but it does not say that in the article. There are multiple examples of this in the Australian media, and it actually happens all over the world. So in Vancouver, late last year, there was a woman who told a TV news crew that she was a keen local property investor, and she spoke to them about buying property. It turned out she was not, in fact, a property investor at all. She worked at a local marketing firm. Just this year, there were two young Chinese sisters who appeared on a TV show as they were going through their hunt for an apartment. So the TV crew followed them to various apartments. And at one of the apartments, one of the girls said, well, we definitely like it here, but we have to talk to our parents. Maybe tomorrow we'll bring them here. If we like this place, we have to tell them. They make the decision. Usually, Chinese people like to buy it this time of year. They were not apartment hunting. They were not sisters. They were assistants who worked in the firm that was marketing the apartments that appeared in the TV show. So there's other kinds of lying. There's also lying about vested interests. This happens a lot. And one of the ways that it happens is when a journalist takes a press release and just essentially drops it into their column under their own name. So you, the reader, think that the journalist has done a lot of research, but in fact a vested interest has done the research. Someone who has a direct financial stake in how you interpret the information that appears in the article. Another way this happens is when a newspaper takes uh, maybe a press release from a university or from another kind of corporation and just drops the entire thing into the newspaper so that the byline, the journalist's name, is the name of the press officer. This is not called journalism, it's called churnalism. Just this ceaseless churn of meaningless content. But the effect is that you think you're reading a journalist and the person that you're reading does not have any loyalty to the reader. They understandably have loyalty to their employers, which is not the newspaper, but in fact, the corporation. So I think one of the most disturbing examples of a symbiosis between the media and real estate in Australia is the regular column that appears in The Age that's written by Enzo Raimondo. Enzo Raimondo is the head of the Real Estate Institute of Victoria, which, of course, is a lobby group. It does actually say in the column that that's what his job is, but what it should actually do is put an entire box around the column and stamp it advertising, because that is all you're ever going to get from Enzo Raimondo. It is his job to make you feel good about whatever is happening in real estate that week and keep your interest up. You will never get impartiality. There are overall some pretty huge lies of imbalance. And these will be very familiar to all of you, I think. For many years, this coverage of this like very complicated, this huge sector of Australian life has cleaved to pretty much one single storyline. And it's a storyline that perfectly suits the advertisers in the lobbies. And it's a triumphal narrative in which certain beliefs 
and hypnotic affirmations are repeated over and over again. You'll meet some of these characters in about a thousand newspaper articles. So for example, people who buy houses are almost always considered brave. People who leverage a lot of property are bold and smart. Renters are somehow always temporary, they're vulnerable, they're often unhappy people. And you will hear again and again that the only 100% guaranteed way to build wealth is to buy real estate. If you meet someone in a newspaper article who expresses skepticism about this, then often they will be called a doom and gloomer. So in addition to these characters, there are certain narratives, very simple lines that happen over and over again. A brave young couple finds a house. They're not sure they can buy it. Then they buy it. <laughs> That's it. Over and over and over again. So one of the ways this kind of narrative becomes entrenched is when all of the sources in an article are people who have an interest in the market that the article is about. Whether they're members of the real estate lobby or they're people in finance who have a direct interest in how many mortgages you want to take out. They're generally not economists or analysts. You know. And of course, there are lies and then there are statistics. And statistics appear a lot in the real estate articles. One statistic that you really want to keep an eye out for is called the clearance rate. And this number is regularly manipulated and it has been done so for years. So the clearance rate is supposedly the percentage of houses that were sold after a weekend's worth of auctions. And what, one of the things that happens with this number is that the total number of houses up for auction shrinks over the weekend. It's a certain number at the start of the weekend. It becomes a different number at the end of the weekend. And no one really acknowledges or necessarily explains why that number has changed. But the effect is that the proportion of houses that seem to have sold is much, much larger in the end. I do a lot of science writing. And there's um, a sort of a category of judgment in science where people say something is not even wrong. So what that means, it's not right, it's not even wrong, it just doesn't make any sense at all. So here's a little example. It's an excerpt from an article from The Australian that made some predictions about the market in 2013, and I don't think it even makes it as a lie. It says, from June 27 through July 17, 2014, Jupiter, which rules expansion, hope, confidence, and optimism, enters Cancer, which rules home and family. Apparently, this is all going to make the property market boom again. Is anyone here a Gemini? <laughs> okay. So apparently from the new moon of September the 5th, you might buy, sell, relocate, lease, change tenants, change landlords, <laughs> change real estate agents, begin renovating, or welcome a baby. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio. Anyone else? This is a shockingly accurate prediction. <laughs> you could be reluctant to make long-term property decisions when you feel negative, pessimistic, and overly cautious. Yet your risk aversion may make you miss out on a bargain. So this article was published around New Year's Eve, and obviously there is a kind of celebratory silliness to having something like this in the newspaper. But, and this is a really important point, it wasn't written by an intern. It wasn't written by a young journalist as a joke. If you look up this article online, the byline links you to a company that bills itself as the world's leading luxury astrology company. I don't know what luxury astrology gives you that normal <laughs> astrology does not. But they will take your credit card details if you want to talk to them further. I think there was a terrible inevitability to this piece, and I think it has too much in common with the journalism that preceded it. I think that when you take away prediction and analysis from impartiality, then this is where you end up. So the cost of being lied to can be very high. 
we can waste our time, we can lose our money, our health and the health of our loved ones can be compromised. There was a recent survey in the US that found that journalists are now one of the least trusted professions of all of the professions. Cynicism about the media is apparently at an all-time high. All of these things are not a coincidence, they're clearly all related to each other. But the problem is that we can't take refuge in blanket cynicism because you have to get your information from somewhere. I think if I were to sum up everything that I find worrying about the media, I think about it as a critical loss of discrimination on the other side of the transom, on the writing side. And the thing is, I think we're going to have to pick up that slack. And we need to develop some tools to be able to deal with those lies. Luckily, a lot of those tools are ones that journalists have so recently abandoned. And some of them are very simple. So three of them that I want to talk about are read wide, read long, <coughs> and fact check. So you need to read wide because there is an excess of opinion in the media or in just the entire world of content these days. And the reason there's so much opinion is because opinion is cheap. It costs money to send people out to talk to other people and to get an actual story. So you really need to be careful about how much opinion you're reading. You need to keep an eye on how often the sources in a story are people who quite obviously have a direct interest in how you feel when you finish reading that story. And the good thing, however, about the internet and about all this information is that you can build yourself a really diverse diet of international and national reporting, international and national opinion, and local blogs as well. You need to read long, because over the last few years, the word length in most newspaper and magazine articles has dropped precipitously. So investigations that used to take 5,000 words to describe are often now just given one or 2,000 words. But there are lots of stories out there in the world that just simply cannot be told at that length. Again, one of the good things about all this extra information is that there are still some traditional places and there are some new places where you can read long. So you can find long film journalism in Australia's The Monthly. And this is great because The Monthly is actually one of the few magazines in the world that does this. You can read it in the traditional places like The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine. These are all online now, so you can read them. And there's a new kind of journalism right now where journalists are putting together really long-form, detailed pieces. And at sites like The Ativist or Byliner, you can buy those by themselves for just a few dollars. Finally, I think you need to fact check, and primarily that's because no one else really is anymore. So pay attention to the publications that you read, and if you can, find out if they employ fact checkers and find out if they employ copy editors. If they have recently offshored their copy editors and their fact checkers, then take everything you read with a much larger grain of salt. Become a citizen fact checker yourself. It used to be that when we threw out our newspaper, if you wanted to actually check something again or look at it again, you had to go down to the State Library and look it up. But now you can just look it up online. So until that changes, we've actually got some really good ways to look back through time, check what someone said previously, and check how many times a particular source has appeared in a section of the newspaper. And I think it is by no means a complete answer but in fact, tune in to online communities for developing around these issues. A lot of the lies that I've spoken about today, and in fact a lot more lies, are uh, dealt with in a number of blogs here in Australia and also all around the world. And I've got a list of those blogs on my website. <coughs> Finally, in addition to these tools and these strategies, I think there is a less personal but probably more important principle at stake here. And that is the principle of the witness. So if you're a writer, real estate is actually an unbelievable story because no matter what everyone here's jobs are, no matter what everyone's family is like, no matter what everyone believes, 
we all have to deal with real estate in some form or another. So it's universal. And it's a really significant universal because there is triumph in real estate. And there is hope, there is aspiration, and there is happiness, and there is regret, and there are terrible decisions, and there is enormous stress, and there is also the feeling of harm. And I think when you tell one single story at the expense of all this incredible human diversity, then that story is a lie. And what it means is, what the cost of this lie is, that no one is actually out there witnessing the lives of people as they are being lived. Witnessing is not easy to do, but witnessing, witnessing the world as it really is, is what all great art and all great science aspires to do. Again, the beauty of the information flood is that even if you don't want to publish your personal story, these days, you can go online and you will probably find that someone has published a story that you see yourself in. And because they've put it out there, then you feel witness to it. So there's a lot of inequity in the world. Life is very short. And truth is tricky. The truth is there are many, many truths. But I think as we get better at witnessing for other people, then we get better at witnessing for ourselves. And then we'll also get better at rejecting the auctioned off, franchise, vested version of our lives that too often we read in the media these days. Thank you.